Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. Although this iconic scene from 2001 A Space Odyssey may have frightened many moviegoers at the time, it's probably what many imagine AI will eventually become. This isn't a new fear. In fact, for a long time now, people have dreaded the loss of jobs due to technological advancements and lack of control over that technology. It's been a lingering thought in pop culture for a long time now. The person went to university. The person buys property. He or she votes. He or she is a stakeholder in society. And that person's job, as well as an entire fleet of professionals like that person, is going to find that their jobs are radically changed or actually completely eliminated. There are some categories of jobs that simply get eliminated and never come back. The Industrial Revolution wasn't very good if you were a horse. That was Kenneth Kukier, senior editor of The Economist Digital Products, and a bit of an alarmist when it comes to the world of AI. Although much of the fear surrounding AI has been around advancements in machinery, nestled within this fear has been the notion that we can reach a state in which the human mind becomes obsolete. Nevertheless, we move forward because the landslide of advancement is too quick to slow, and in this case, too great to stop. We have to be the master of this technology, not its servant. The advertising tech space is one that is slowly adopting technology, and in doing so is helping to solve some of the biggest issues facing the ad space today. Among them, attribution, relevance or personalization, and identity. These mark the top issues facing the advertising space, and all of these may find solutions with the implementation of artificial intelligence and machine learning. The consumer journey is riddled with expressions of many forms across many channels, and in order to understand this journey, we have to be able to curate these expressions. However, there are approximately 312 million internet users in the US today, each generating 2.5 billion gigabytes of data every 24 hours. Marketers are therefore turning to AI to transform this data into manageable and usable insights. So in 1955, some guy walk, or, or is driving down the road with his son in the, in, the, in the pickup truck next to him. They see this billboard, they walk into McDonald's. Uh, uh, if you then go up to that guy and say, hey, why are you here? I don't think he's going to say, oh, I saw the billboard and I came in. And in fact, if you ask him, hey, there was a billboard that, uh, that you passed. Have you passed it before yet? Passed it many times. Is that the reason you came in here? He would say, I don't know. I've seen 10,000 ads for McDonald's. If you ask the franchise owner, hey, you bought that billboard on the side of the road that's just the exit before people get off to come into this, uh, this store, uh, is it working? They would say, I don't know, uh, but uh, I'm afraid to take it down. This represents an issue with the old ways of advertising. Attribution, that is, assigning the appropriate amount of credit to each user action or combination of actions that led to the desired behavior. In other words, how much credit should the billboard get in influencing the man to stop at that McDonald's? Which of the 10,000 ads across multiple touch points was the one that convinced him? The truth is, it's likely a combination of events in a particular order that influenced this man's decision. This problem has been around for a while, and mostly because we didn't have the computational infrastructure to collect, process, or even store this amount of data. The truth is, all marketers want to know that if we put a dollar out, what will we get in return? How do you validate your investment relative to the return? And still today, lower funnel activities tend to get the most credit. As Kenneth Kukier puts it, More data doesn't just let us see more, more of the same thing we were looking at. More data allows us to see new. It allows us to see better. It allows us to see different. In this respect, the data has gone from a stock to a flow, from something that is stationary and static to something that is fluid and dynamic. There is, if you will, a liquidity to information. It is important to distinguish between the main types of data, 
like structured data is basically what it sounds like. Information organized into data sets that can be anything from customer demographics to browsing history. Machine learning has the ability to perform specific tasks with this type of data without human interaction, and perform massive computations to produce real-time results. But this doesn't really leverage the power of AI. Unstructured data, the kind that makes up 80% of the almost 3 billion gigabytes per day, almost 1 gigabyte per person per day, is what AI can revolutionize. This is everything from written text to speech and images. AI's ability to process large volumes of this data and to do so quickly is what distinguishes it from traditional computer processing. AI has the ability to analyze the nuances of language and even derive meaning from it. It can recognize true consumer behavior from analyzing pictures and videos that people post on social media, and it can pick out personality characteristics from all these analyses. Now the problem of attribution doesn't seem so difficult. Linking a desired action to an advertising impression no longer seems impossible. In fact, if we go back to our McDonald's analogy, the owner of the restaurant can now know exactly how much of his advertising money is being wasted, and whether that billboard does anything to improve his ROI. The more data we gather, the clearer the picture becomes. We no longer have to settle for giving credit to the last touch, but instead, we can see how each touch point and interaction influence the user to convert. I think that the fact that everybody in America gets the same ads at the same time for the same products has never made that much sense. I grew up in a small coal town in western Pennsylvania. My mother's still there. There's not a Starbucks within, there's one Starbucks 55 miles away, but probably not another one for 80 miles. Um, I live in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. There's more people in my block than in my hometown. And she gets the same ads, same time, same products. Can't even buy the same things. With the advancements in AI, we can now move towards addressing relevance and personalization in advertising. Considering AI can process and analyze language and derive meaning and nuances from images, written text, and speech, it stands to reason that it can use these features to produce content made for a specific user. However, one of the challenges to this is that AI and machine learning rely heavily on having sufficient amounts of the right data to learn over time. It's why search engines are so efficient at coming up with answers to your questions, and why when you Google what is AI, you get served with a more direct answer, and even suggested answers for common follow-up questions. So, success in personalization is dependent on obtaining lots of the right data on consumers. AI can produce original content, however. Fox approached IBM and they said, well, we have this movie coming out. It's called Morgan. And it's an AI horror thriller. <sighs> and then what Fox asked was, could Watson analyze the movie and generate a trailer automatically? human beings, we're very quick to judge the mood of an individual. Possibly an AI um, over time might be able to develop those st same instincts. So we thought, let's send Watson to film school. Morgan was our little breakthrough. Here, IBM's Watson was able to analyze an array of movie ads using image, speech, and natural language generation to create a trailer for the horror movie Morgan. I'll link the trailer in the description. However, for this to be successful in the advertising realm, it has to respond to a specific consumer and it has to do so at scale. In Brazil, Unilever's Axe brand created 100,000 permutations for an ad for Axe body spray in order to create an experience where each person feels like the ad was made for them. Similarly, Sachi LA trained IBM Watson to write thousands of ads for Toyota, tailoring them for more than 100 different customer segments. Admittedly, there are still problems to work through. Berger Thorne, CTO of Decision Analytics at Experian says, there's also a transparency factor when it comes to AI and machine learning. If a business uses machine learning a machine learning system to predict a user's next playlist or song choice, the results might be skewed if the user's friend takes over the music during a road trip. The machine's next few suggested songs or playlists might not make sense to the user until the algorithm starts to learn again with the original user. 
This will likely become less of an issue as we move closer to delivering a personalized experience. Here, the machine is likely to have so much information on the user that it will detect anomalous activity almost instantly, and therefore not include it in the algorithm. Through this type of content creation, addressable TV advertising and personalized creative will be attainable. It's only a matter of time. We want to reach the person we think we're reaching. It's that simple. Across a consistent journey as they move from one media type to another. The problem is it's very hard to recognize the consumer these days. As an example, I have over 20 digital identities. It turns out that every time I log into a website, every email address I have, every time I use a different web browser on my computer, on my phone, on my tablet, that is a different identity. There's not an easy way to unify these and have a consistent way of speaking to a customer. Uh, um, and all that's in a cookie, almost 99% uh, of the time, is just a single ID. It, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, uh, the consumer personally. There's no name, there's no social security number. There's no what they call PII, or personally identifiable information. Cookies are a line of text sent to your browser when you visit a site. This can happen from three different sources. First party cookies are dropped by the publisher's site. For example, if you visit Nike.com, Nike can drop a cookie on your browser and use it to connect some of your activity, such as where you went immediately after their site, when you returned, and what pages you visited while you were gone. However, there is no link between your identity and the cookie. So sites can only target a collection of cookies and devices, and not real people. Second-party cookies basically describe the sharing or selling of first-party data with another business. But for the purposes of this video, we won't go into that. Third-party cookies, however, are extremely relevant today. They are cookies dropped by advertisers via your interaction with the publisher's site. Say, for example, that you visited NewYorkTimes.com, and you got served a banner ad for Burger King. This ad dropped a cookie on your browser to also monitor your behavior, called a third-party cookie. However, visiting the site means the New York Times also dropped a cookie, and each ad you viewed on that page also got an opportunity to drop a cookie. So, why so many cookies from one site visit? As Jeff Green puts it, the primary reason for a cookie is, if the New York Times lays down a cookie, that's them basically saying, you are ABC. And if Burger King lays down a cookie, that's them saying, you're XYZ. And they're just putting identifiers on users, so that when they get other data points from, from those users, they can lump all those events together. However, third-party cookies are falling under increasing scrutiny. The rationale is that by visiting the publisher site, you have agreed to an interaction with them. However, the ad you are served has no relationship to you. There was no permission and there are no limitations. There's virtually there's a virtually unlimited number of advertisers that can get access to you and drop a cookie without your permission. For this reason, many in the industry believe that third-party cookies will be phased out with new regulation. You're you're saying, okay, consumers have decided that because of those three things, the regulatory and the um, technology and the mistrust of third-party cookies, Consumers are trying to figure out how we delete third-party cookies. Apple has incorporated a system to detect and completely eliminate third-party cookies from the Safari browsing experience. They stated, This information is collected without permission and is used for ad retargeting, which is how ads follow people around the internet. The new intelligent tracking prevention feature detects and eliminates cookies and other data used for the cross-site tracking, which means it helps keep a person's browsing private. I spoke to Dave Lewis, digital media manager at Google, who said, This piece that we've had on um, being able to track kind of the full path of a user based on a cookie is probably going away. It's, it's a scary time if you've built, and most of our advertisers have, you've built a lot of core competency based on third-party tracking. The regulatory piece hasn't really hit the U.S. yet, um, and that will be the piece that will really kind of shape, you know, the lawmakers can really quickly say, 
wait, this is how you got around the regulation amendment and the whole, uh, the whole startup is gone. With the rollout of new regulation in the California Consumer Privacy Act and the global data protection regulation in Europe, it is clear that lawmakers lack some of the understanding necessary to design the right kinds of protections for consumers. You said back then that Facebook would always be free. Is that still your objective? Senator, yes. Well, if so, how do you sustain a business model in which users don't pay for your service? Senator, we run ads. I see. Nevertheless, the regulation is coming. And those that make changes beyond any stopgap measures, those that really try to change the landscape of the advertising industry, can benefit from these changes in regulation. AI and machine learning will certainly play a role. Speaking to Jifei Ma from the AI team at the Trade Desk, he had this to say, the greatest contribution that AI can make to the industry is to offer the possibility of making advertising work for both advertisers and consumers. Specifically, AI can help advertisers to optimize their campaign, such as spending the budget wisely and increasing conversions or brand awareness, and at the same time, help consumers to enjoy their online experience, such as seeing only the relevant ads at the right moment and without privacy being violated. In the past, the advertising industry did not enjoy a very positive reputation compared to other industries. Applying AI ethically in advertising will change that. In this respect, the data has gone from a stock to a flow, from something that is stationary and static to something that is fluid and dynamic. There is, if you will, a liquidity to information. What it implies is a hundredfold multiplication in the stock of information that is connected via an IP address. Now, if the number of connections that we can make is proportional to the number of pairs of data points, a hundredfold multiplication in the quantity of data is a ten thousandfold multiplication in the number of patterns that we can see in that data. This just in the last 10 or 11 years. This, I would submit, is a sea change, a profound change in the economics of the world that we live in. So, it stands to reason that this data, or the patterns we see in the data, will have a multitude of possible interpretations. More data might allow us to see new, to see better, and see differently, but how we decide to act on this data will depend on how we interpret it. I predict that this interpretation of data will be the crucial differentiator. The many interpretations possible with the same data will be how one advertiser distinguishes itself from another. This will depend on the design of AI and machine learning systems. What will they be based on? What behaviors do we want them to emulate or be sensitive to? These are the questions we will be asking in the new chapter of the Information Age.